Um, and as uh, he said in the introduction, today I'll be talking about our uh, recent work on uh, bringing sanity to smartphones. So uh, typically, uh, when I give this talk in, in person, uh, I ask this question to the audience uh, to raise their hands and say, how many of you have phones uh, which have uh, a chat app installed on your phone? And almost everyone these days has at least one, if not many, uh, chat applications um, installed on their mobile phones. Uh, now, if you look at the attacker surface of who all can look at your communication that you're, you're doing over these chat apps, uh, most of these, especially WhatsApp and Signal, have end-to-end -end encryption. So anyone who is on the network will not be able to look at your messages. Uh, but when uh, the messages are there on your phone, uh, they, they are basically uh, decrypted and visible uh, to your phone, especially your operating system. And so if you have some malware on your phone, or if your apps have bad permissions, or if there are bugs and security vulnerabilities, uh, let's say in these apps or uh, even in the operating system, um, then the attacker can break this end-to-end -end encryption and start looking at your uh, chat messages, uh, which is bad. Uh, the good news is that these days, uh, all the smartphones that you use uh, either mostly run on Android or Google, uh, Android from Google and uh, iOS from Apple. Uh, and these two companies have large uh, and very well-trained teams of uh, scientists, engineers, security experts who ensure um, that the smartphone ecosystem does not have any of these problems, for example, malware and permission abuse and security vulnerabilities. Uh, however, uh, if you trust just these two companies to uh, to do the security correctly, then there is a bit of imbalance of, of power. Uh, they are not immune to mistakes, right? So, for example, both uh, Apple and Google uh, in the recent past uh, were found tracking uh, the location data of the smartphone users, even if the users said, don't track my location. Uh, so this is bad. Uh, there are other examples of these two companies uh, trying to misuse the power that they have on, on the smartphone ecosystem. Uh, there is a very famous uh, lawsuit uh, from Fortnite, the game creators uh, who sued Apple and Google, uh, because when uh, the app was running uh, or offered on the Play Store, uh, the app creators had to pay a certain amount of fees uh, to Apple and Google for hosting their uh, their game on the App Store, and the only other option was to remove this game from the App Store. Uh, so certainly, this protection that uh, Apple and Google gives us doesn't come for, for free. Uh, more interestingly, or more urgently, uh, during the COVID pandemic, a similar issue uh, showed up uh, where um, at least people in, in Europe, uh, some of my colleagues here uh, in ETH, uh, and, and Several other researchers across Europe were trying to build a contact recovery uh, and contact tracing applications on smartphones. Uh, and the science of it was done, the engineering of it was done, but when uh, uh, they wanted to run the contact tracing app uh, on a real phone, um, Apple and Google would not allow uh, the app to uh, look at the Bluetooth beacons at a very high frequency, which is what was needed for contact tracing. Um, and a lot of governments, uh, big governments in Europe, then had to uh, go and talk uh, to Apple and Google in order to enable this uh, functionality, um, or even something as critical uh, as a global pandemic-related uh, health app. Uh, so. If you are with me so far, you might uh, wonder, hey, it looks like you did, clearly don't like the decisions of, uh, of uh, Apple and Google, uh, just stop using their smartphones. Uh, and the, the, the question is, what are your options if you don't want this, this ecosystem? Well, there are multiple uh, options these days. Uh, there is Graphene OS, which is kind of a hardened uh, version of Android. Uh, there are Linux-based phones, uh, for example, Ubuntu phones, Pine phone, uh, Librem, and, and so on. Uh, the problem is, uh, if you want to switch to such a Linux or alternate uh, uh, phone operating system universe, uh, you lose out on a lot of performance, a lot of uh, user interactions, a lot of uh, uh, interfaces that you as a user are very comfortable with on, on Apple and Android uh, ecosystem. And so ideally, what you want uh, is you want to have 
the comfort of the existing ecosystem, but you also want to have the ability to, to let's say, install whatever apps you want. Uh, of course, while taking uh, uh, the onus of, hey, if this app uh, is malware, then Google and Android uh, or iOS and Apple will not be able to protect you. Uh, but you as a user want to have this flexibility of installing the apps, uh, giving them access to, let's say, things like location or uh, Bluetooth without uh, the, the operating system companies trying to enforce their uh, uh, choices on you. And the, more importantly, there are cases, for example, you know, a messaging app that I started out with where uh, you don't want the operating system to look at your messages and that's not something which you can have today. Uh, and if you were to have the software ecosystem, then perhaps you can run uh, messaging apps like, uh, like Signal and WhatsApp on your Android and iOS without the operating system, even the operating system being able to look at uh, your messages, which is certainly an improved level of security uh, that you would desire for your for your uh, private messaging. Um, and today, you have this option if you are willing to carry two phones. And I know a lot of people uh, who work in, let's say, governments or industry, uh, where they do essentially have two phones. One is a work phone, uh, which has much higher security primitives, and one is a kind of a personal phone where they run uh, all their social media apps, for example. Right. Uh, so far, I have motivated the need for this sovereign ecosystem from a user's perspective. And I gave the example of a secure chat app or contact tracing, which benefits the, the user. Uh, however, there are two other stakeholders uh, in this ecosystem. One is the operating system itself. Uh, I'm pretty sure even companies like Apple and Google uh, want to have sovereignty on the, on the phone. Uh, they don't, for example, want the user uh, to be able to look at their sensitive IP, right? For example, if they have a photo gallery application, uh, which is a subscription model, where let's say they uh, load uh, very expensive, uh, trained uh, uh, image enhancement models, they ship it onto your phone so that uh, you can enhance your photo gallery. Uh, these companies don't want their uh, models to leak. Uh, and if you have it on the phone, the user might be able to extract them or misuse them. Right? So definitely, uh, the, the operating system companies also want to have same level of, of security. And lastly, uh, there are also services that come from your phone manufacturer, uh, the, the, the companies uh, which create the, the chips that that are used to build your phone. For example, uh, biometric authentication is something uh, which is a feature um, that, that you get from the security chips on your phone. Uh, and the companies who build this would definitely want that feature to be secure from, let's say, bugs or attacks from uh, software uh, written by the operating system or random applications loaded by the users. Uh, and now in this ecosystem, there are three of these stakeholders who want to do independent, secure computation on the phone, and then this becomes a, an interesting problem. Uh, so if you look at the current uh, ecosystem of how do these actors fit in, uh, this is uh, so most of the phones these days run on ARM, and this is how the ARM ecosystem looks like. So on the bottom, there are a few peripherals. For example, uh, your fingerprint sensor, the camera, uh, the display, uh, the flash memory. There are a few physical buttons. Maybe you have LEDs. Um, Wi-Fi network cards and, and, and GPS. And so, so these are the physical peripherals uh, that are on your phone. On the software side of things, at the lowest uh, level on the software stack, with the highest privilege, uh, there is the firmware, um, which is given to you typically by the hardware manufacturer. Uh, and the operating system might have some privilege code that runs at this layer. Uh, and there is a there is a smaller part called a secure monitor, which does, let's say, security enforcement on the, on the phone. Uh, then as a user, as a normal everyday user, you typically are aware of, let's take an example of Android, Android uh, uh, universe or the, the Android user space, and then all the apps that you install, let's say, from the app store, your WhatsApp, your Signal, your Netflix, and, and whatever. Uh, however, there are a lot of other components in this ecosystem uh, which are not really visible directly to the user. So if you look at what the manufacturer and the operating system do in this in this space, uh, there is a whole different world, uh, literally a world called a secure world uh, that runs on your phone. Uh, 
there is a hypervisor there, which is called Hafnium. It depends on which phone you're on. Uh, Google has, has built this hypervisor called Hafnium, which runs in the secure world. Uh, there is an entire operating system. Uh, one example is Opti. There are several other operating systems that run in the secure world. Uh, there are different platform drivers uh, that companies have written, which run here. And there are secure applications uh, that also run in this in the secure world that I've shown in blue color. Right? Uh, this world is typically not visible to normal users. Uh, that's something that the manufacturer uh, controls and besides uh, all the software stack that goes here. So the example of the fingerprint analysis uh, or the fingerprint detection that I gave you is typically an application which, which runs in this blue secure world. Uh, and in terms of security, uh, the property is that uh, the secure world, which I've shown in blue, uh, can access everything in the normal world, in the, in the orange world. Right Now, this is dangerous because if uh, there is any bug in applications, Opti, Hafnium, and all of this blue stack, uh, because uh, this world has the ability to access Android, an attacker can first go exploit, uh, exploit the secure world, use that attack to then uh, start attacking Android. And this has happened in the past. Even if Android is perfect and is free of bugs, um, the attacker cannot compromise it, they go and attack other applications uh, which run in the secure world to do this. Right? Uh, from an operating systems perspective, there are, again, a lot of things uh, that show up. Right? So first, uh, there is a hypervisor, if not one, two hypervisors at this EL2 level. So PKVM is a, a hypervisor that comes these days with Android. Uh, Gunia is a hypervisor, which, for example, Qualcomm, the manufacturer of, uh, let's say, Snapdragon, which is a, which is a, a state-of-the-art uh, processor that is used in Samsung and a bunch of other phones, uh, they have a hypervisor which runs here. Right? Uh, why do people run hypervisors? So it, it is so that they can launch these virtual machines. So here I've shown a few examples. Uh, so PKVM, this is a, a hypervisor by Android. They use it to launch sensitive applications from Android, right? Uh, so there are some uh, applications which they don't want to run in Android because Android is so big, it might get compromised. And so what Google does is they launch some of their trusted applications, for example, uh, software updates uh, and so on uh, in this PKVM VM, right? So this is, I've shown it in yellow color. Uh, there are some other platform services that Qualcomm may want to run. Uh, so it can launch its own virtual machine uh, and run these green services uh, on your on your phone. Right? Uh, so long story short, uh, all of these three entities are trying to create isolation on your phone, either using hardware, so using the secure world, or using software virtualization and hypervisor to launch these uh, virtual machines. Right. Uh, the question here is, is why isn't this a solution to solve the sovereignty problem that I motivated earlier? Uh, well, there are two problems. One is if you run it in the secure world, um, anything that runs there is overprivileged. It will be able to attack Android and all these other virtual machines. If you use a hypervisor, that's actually great because then you have VMs which are isolated from each other. But then the question is, who maintains this hypervisor? In this, in this diagram, I've shown you three hypervisors from, well, two of them are from Google, which also controls Android, and one of them is in, from Qualcomm, which controls the, the hardware, right? So if, you're, if our motivation was we don't want to give so much control to Android, uh, using the hypervisor doesn't solve this problem because the hypervisor is also given to you by Android and can still do the same um, access control and stop you from launching apps or accessing Bluetooth uh, via this hypervisor. So it doesn't really solve uh, the, the sovereignty problem that we wanted to solve. Uh, this is where I'll present our, our solution. Uh, it's called T-Time. Um, and it builds on a lot of these isolation mechanisms and observations that, that we have seen in the past. Uh, and what we uh, propose is a new um, uh, abstraction. It's called a domain. Um, and essentially, whatever you have today, uh, meaning Android and your uh, rich applications, uh, we want them to execute as is uh, in, in a legacy domain. 
Uh, and if you see here, the legacy domain has direct access to peripherals, right? So uh, your Android operating system will directly be able to access all the peripherals on your phone. Uh, there is a new component we introduced called the security monitor, uh, which then does domain isolation for you. If you notice, it's not an EL2, it's an EL3, so it's not a hypervisor, it's essentially a part of the phone there. Okay, and what the security monitor in T-Time lets us to do is create different domains. So here we create a different domain called as a sovereign domain. Um, and the sovereign domain is completely under the control of the user, right? So the user can do almost everything that they want there. Uh, in this case, I have launched a chat application in EL0. So pick your favorite chat application or write your own. And that's what we run in EL0. Uh, this does not have to go through any app store and so on. Uh, it's, it runs in its own domain. The second thing is uh, this chat application needs some software in, in order to be able to run on the phone. And so uh, T-Time lets you uh, run things like its own runtime uh, in EL1. So this could be full-fledged Android. This could be Linux. This could be a formally verified kernel up to the user to decide what runtime do they want to execute there. Uh, and then the third observation is that the sovereign domain, since it's also a domain, can directly access peripherals. So this is a big difference from, let's say, hypervisors, where there is virtualization that happens. Here we have direct access to peripherals. And more importantly, the security monitor ensures that the so sovereign domain and legacy domain are isolated from each other. So if you have a bad chat application, which has bugs, or if you have a runtime, which has bugs, it will get compromised, uh, but it will be controlled and contained, uh, it will not be able to compromise Android or even your other applications, in this case, WhatsApp and, and Netflix. Right? So this gives the user the sovereignty or the freedom to run whatever they want without putting your existing legacy domains at risk. Right? Uh, and so we claim that this is a way more simple and pragmatic solution. Uh, it does not disrupt existing operating systems and apps. You don't have to recompile them or rewrite them. Um, they will run as is. So if you still want to use these rich apps while taking the risks uh, of, of ha them having bugs, fine. But let's say when you on your phone want to use the chat application, you can switch from legacy domain to sovereign domain. Uh, and then you know that it's executing securely. And Android is not able to look at or change or control any of your interactions with your chat application, including communication over the network, uh, saving things to uh, the flash, and also the things that you see on the screen or the things that you type in your, in your chat app. Right? Because here, the display is completely allocated and assigned to the software domain. So the Android world cannot even see what you're doing. That's the kind of uh, security you want for your uh, chat application. Um, as I said, we don't have a hypervisor here. So the EL2 is blank. If you want, you can have a hypervisor in the legacy domain. So all the other uh, PKVM and so on that I showed you earlier will continue to work for the legacy domain, but we don't use it for security. Uh, our solution is uh, based in the firmware modifications. Um, and then, yeah, the last uh, point I uh, noted is direct assignment to peripherals, uh, and the isolation is done by the hardware, not software. Uh, and since there is no software to do the isolation, there is no software to enforce control. And this was the problem with the hypervisor. It was a great solution, but we ended it uh, with a question of who controls the hypervisor. Here, since we don't rely on any software, there is no way to control that. Uh, so the second part uh, of, of the talk is how do we achieve this uh, isolation on existing smartphone devices? All right, so I'll go back to the example of uh, our chat app. Uh, let's say we have decided to run this chat app in the sovereign domain. It needs a few things right, in terms of resources. It needs execution, so it needs some CPU cores to execute the logic. It needs some memory to load the data and show you the UI and so on. It needs access to network and storage, so it has to go talk to the signal server, let's say, to fetch messages. Uh, maybe you have chat history stored on your flash, so it needs to retry, retrieve that. And it needs to then display all of this on your touch screen so that you can look at your messages, type, and send responses, and so on. Um, so these are all the resources that your sovereign domain needs. Uh, and there, there's, of course, the rest of the applications and so on. Right? So that, that that stays in the legacy domain. So the legacy domain continues to perform scheduling. It decides what runs when. It manages memory. 
these are the heavy lifting tasks of an operating system that's what is very complicated and has a lot of software uh, and gives you performance so we want to keep that in the legacy world and use all of those features from android we don't want to redo that link uh, and any peripherals which are not assigned to your software domain stay in the legacy domain so for example gps bluetooth and so on uh, will be still available in the legacy domain if you are listening to music let's say on headphones you can still keep listening to the music because uh, that, that's being handled by Android in the legacy domain while you're on your phone display, you're using your chat. Okay, so the first challenge in, in achieving this goal is how do you achieve execution and memory isolation, so CPU and, and memory isolation. Uh, so the good news is that uh, this piece of firmware, the security monitor that we introduced is able to use existing hardware mechanisms uh, to give this uh, to give this isolation. So the first one is CPU isolation. Uh, and what we do, one way to do this is your phone has multiple CPU cores, right? Um, and what we can do is we can schedule the legacy domain on one core. Uh, and when you want to launch a sovereign app, let's say by pressing a button, uh, we take a second core and run our sovereign domain for some time. Um, and so this is isolated in space. We give one core to legacy domain and one core to uh, sovereign domain. So that is called, that we call spatial isolation. Uh, the second mode is called temporal isolation. So you take all the cores that are executing and uh, you either give all of them to sovereign domain or you put some of them uh, to sleep, right? So that, uh, so basically at any moment in time, only one domain is executing on all the cores of your, of your phone. Um, and of course, there is a combination of spatial and temporal that you can keep doing, right? Uh, so you can either uh, ensure that they're isolating on different cores or isolating at different times, right? Uh, and by this, you ensure that they do not interfere with each other's computation. Right? If they're running on different cores, they cannot interfere with each other's computation. And this also allows for uh, resource flexibility. Uh, the second part is memory accessing. So let's say, one of these domains is executing on each of these cores, they also need to access their own memory, uh, and we need to ensure that they are not able to access each other's memory. Uh, so for that, uh, we use um, an existing hardware feature called a uh, Trusonet Space Controller, which allows us to do this memory isolation. So here, if you see at time t1, the whole memory is accessible to the legacy domain, but at time t2, you have kind of split the memory into two halves, uh, the upper half uh, stays accessible to the legacy domain, whereas the lower half is only accessible to the sovereign domain. And this isolation is done based on core ID. So we can tell the memory controller, hey, core one should be only able to access this half, core two should be only able to access this other half. And, and so even if they have bugs or attacker controlled software in there, uh, the hardware will stop uh, these cores from being able to access each other's memory. Right? And again, this can be done uh over space so you can do half and half uh, or you can basically disable the entire other half of the memory accesses only the yellow parts are, are going to be accessible uh when the sovereign domain is running on its on its course right uh so this is again not really a new contribution a lot of prior works have have done this with the exact hardware features uh, that i mentioned uh it's just that in in t time we kind of allow for uh, both spatial and uh, temporal isolation for memory and CP. Okay, the more interesting part of T-time is uh, this aspect of peripherals, right? Uh, that's something which has not been uh, looked into so much in prior work. Uh, there are a lot of questions, especially since phone is something which is uh, every all of us are familiar with. Uh, there are a lot of questions that that show up, right? Uh, when do you attach and detach peripherals? to a domain. Are they statically assigned in the sense that whenever I'm running my chat app, uh, my network, my disk, my my, uh, my touch screen is always going to be attached to the chat app? Or can I transfer them between each other? If I transfer them, how do I transfer them? So on and so forth, right? Uh, so going back to the example of a chat application, if you look at touch screen as one of the peripherals, you can conclude that the touch screen needs to be exclusively assigned uh, to the chat application. In the sense, when I'm using my app, uh, the entire touch screen should completely be assigned uh, to the chat app. Why? Because there's no real way of doing sharing, 
right? Yes, I mean, you might have done half and half uh, screen sharing, right? You you put your whatever chat app on the top and your YouTube app on the bottom, uh, a lot of that, but all of that is enabled by software. Uh, and since we don't trust the software, we can't really do sharing uh, or virtual, uh, isolation of the screen. Right? So we decided uh, when you're on the chat app, your screen is exclusively assigned uh, to the chat app, meaning if you have anything else which needs access to the screen, it will be denied. Uh, but there are other resources such as storage and network which can be sh safely shared. Right? For example, we can allow proxy. Um, whenever you send data uh, over the network, the, the network card doesn't need to be exclusively mapped to your app. Uh, as long as you're encrypting and integrity protecting your data that you're sending out, multiple apps can continue to use the network uh, peripheral. Similarly, for storage, uh, if you have a secure channel, meaning you're doing uh, integrity protection, encryption, replay protection, and all of that, which can be done in software, then multiple apps can share the storage, right? Uh, and so uh, in, in T-Time, for each peripheral, you have these different modes of sharing or ownership uh, that, that we can enable. Um, and then the third question is, OK, so what does it mean to do peripheral isolation? Thank you for showing me the modes, but how does this look like uh, in, in memory? Uh, so one good news is that peripherals, uh, when they're accessed, um, they're also accessed via memory mapping. right? So when you say, I'm trying to access the network or my touch screen under the hood, it's essentially you're still trying to access some memory addresses. Right? And we apply the same principle of memory isolation to peripheral isolation. And in this case, um, if you have core one, which is running a uh, legacy domain, uh, it has access to some memory, and it has access to some memory that belongs to other peripherals. Right? But if on core two, if you're running sovereign domain, uh, then you have it has access to some part of memory, and it has complete access to the touch screen, meaning the configuration registers and the buffers and, and all of the hardware um, addresses that belong to the touch screen are mapped exclusively uh, to, to, the, uh, to the sovereign domain. Right? Uh, so the same principle applies. Um, here, uh, the touch screen is exclusively mapped in the sense that if you see here, uh, all of the color is completely yellow. right? And after some time, you want to give over the access to the touch screen back to the legacy domain. Uh, you can disable the access for a while, clean up any residual data, uh, maybe reset the drivers, and then uh, give it back uh, to the to the legacy domain, right? Um, and similarly, you can do this over time. When uh, uh, the sovereign domain is executing, no other app is executing, and um, uh, that's why the, the the legacy domain will not be able to attack. OK, so that was for memory. Um, the other question is, let's see. OK, so the other question that shows up with peripherals is interrupt management. right? So essentially, if you look at uh, Android, or for that matter, any high performance uh, compute these days, um, handling interrupts is something that is critical. Right. Uh, in fact, if you look at ARM and Android uh, phones these days, they have a dedicated um, uh, component called the general interrupt control. So, so okay. um, and what happens is whenever your peripheral wants to notify uh, these applications about something, uh, they send an interrupt uh, to the operating system, and the operating system then notifies the application that, hey, something happened. Right? For example, there was a new packet, or someone is trying to open the camera, and so on and so forth. Uh, so the problem now that we have is, as I said earlier, we want to assign the peripherals completely to these domains, which means uh, only the domain which owns that peripheral should be able to configure interrupts, so set up which interrupts to deliver and which interrupts to ignore. Uh, when the, the interrupt shows up, whether to receive it or not, which code to route it to, uh, which handler to execute, and, and so on. Right. Um, so essentially, you need to do interrupt isolation the same way we did uh, CPU memory. Uh, the bad news is that the trick that we have been using so far of this address space based isolation, meaning this memory is only accessible to this domain, this memory is only accessible to that domain, doesn't really generally apply to interrupt isolation. Why? Because this gig is a hardware uh, component. 
um, the way it represents interrupts is in, in form of, of these tables. Right? Uh, so essentially, what we want to achieve is two things. Uh, when we assign each of these peripherals to our domain, so in this case, uh, if we say that the touch screen uh, is exclusively mapped uh, to the chat app, which is running in the sovereign domain, uh, we need to ensure that whenever the touch screen generates any interrupts, uh, they always go to core two and only core two, right? Because core two is the one which is executing the chat app in the sovereign domain. Similarly, if uh, someone wants to change any configuration for the interrupts for that chat app, it should always come only for from core two because that's the core which owns that peripheral. Right? If core one tries to do any reconfiguration, that should be disallowed. Uh, if any of these peripherals try to send interrupts to core two, that should also be disallowed. So on and so forth. Right? Uh, so here is a textbook uh, way of how interrupt handling works on. Uh, Right. So essentially, when the device boots up, uh, all the interrupts are disabled. So the, there is this um, uh, row called active. And for each interrupt ID, it is saying that uh, the interrupt is not active. So basically, interrupts are disabled. Uh, then each of these cores, which typically runs uh, Android operating systems, uh, what it does is that it goes and sequentially enables interrupts for particular devices. So for example, your core one is trying to say uh, enable uh, interrupts for, for display. And then core one says that via some uh, interface, uh, then the status of interrupt number three, which belongs to, uh, which is mapped to the, uh, to the display, is set to be active. Right? So this is configuration of enabling and disabling interrupts. Then during execution, if the display wants to send an interrupt, so fire an interrupt and inform the core, uh, it can it can do that, right? So for example, uh, this is the flow uh, of firing an interrupt, right? So it comes again to this uh, gig. Uh, the interrupt is mapped as pending, right? Because it's fired but not handled. Then any of these cores can pick the interrupt up. In this case, the gig has decided to route this interrupt to core two. This is the baseline execution, so the gig can arbitrarily decide which code to send this to. OK, code to receives this interrupt. Uh, it now execute, starts executing. Uh, its execution gets interrupted, and it handles that interrupt. So there is a code that executes to handle this interrupt. Once it's done, it sets uh, the interrupt uh, from pending to handle so the preset. Right? So that's the flow of configuring interrupts, uh, routing interrupts, handling, and then uh, changing the state. OK, now with t time, this all of this flow needs to be isolated. right? Uh, essentially, configurations have to be isolated. Delivery has to be isolated. And then how do you do that? Uh, so let's take an example of uh, temporal mode isolation. Right? Uh, so in temporal mode, what we mean is that only one domain is executing at any time, uh, or the, the, the other domain is not running. So you can safely. Uh, disable the interrupts uh, for, for others, right? So first of all, uh, first is configuration. So if you get configuration requests um, uh, from a domain which is not active at the moment, uh, you can just ignore them, right? How do you do that? Well, uh, we repurpose this another feature in the gig, which is called the secure bit. Uh, if uh, we, we observe that if we mark um, the secure bits uh, for each interrupt to be zero, then no core can do configurations, right? So that's what we used. We said, hey, when, um, for example, when the uh, legacy domain is executing, uh, we do not want the, those legacy domains to configure any interrupts uh, for our display, which belongs to the sovereign domain. And so we will set that bit to be one. So if the bit is set to be one, the cores cannot do any configuration, right? So even if they try, it will be rejected. Whereas all the other bits are set to zero, so the cores can continue reconfig uh, reconfiguring uh, the interrupts for that. So that's one. Uh, the second is how do you stop? So this was about configuration, right? But the peripherals can still keep firing the interrupts. Uh, how do, if they're fired, how do you stop the routing? So the, to stop the routing, we uh, we use this active feed. Uh, we just mark uh, that interrupt to be inactive, right? So if it's inactive. Uh, the gig ignores uh, the interrupts when they're fired. Right. Uh, so by using the secure 
bit and active bit creatively, we, will, we were able to make sure that if the sovereign domain is not executing, then the peripherals that it owns cannot be configured or uh, even if they fire interrupts, they will they will not be routed to, to the unsecured course. Right. Uh, so that was temporal mode. That was easy. We knew that only one mode is executing at one time. So when we switch from uh, sovereign to legacy and legacy to sovereign, we can we can do these these changes. They're static as long as only one mode is executing on a core. Okay. Now more challenging is spatial mode. Uh, spatial mode, as a reminder, is you have two cores in parallel executing two different domains right which means now you have to during execution decide which core is trying to do configuration which peripheral is, is it trying to configure is that allowed or not and similarly for routing the, the interrupt right so to stop configurations what we do is we basically blanket deny access uh, to the to the gic so none of the cores by default are directly allowed to access the, the GIC. Instead, what we uh, what we do is we have uh, we basically mark them as inaccessible. If and when they try to access the configuration, it creates a fault. Uh, this goes into our security monitor in the form where who can then in the handler check which core was trying to access, uh, which configuration was it trying to access, does it own it? Okay, looks like it does. Then via via this firmware we replay this configuration if it's safe. If it's not safe, the firmware says, I'm not going to let you do this configuration, right? So we have this checking mechanism um, before the configurations are allowed to be changed. Okay, great, that was easy. Uh, what about routing? So when the interrupt fires, what happens? So in this case, uh, our interrupt uh, is fired by the display, which we know should only be routed to core two. Right? If, uh, core one does not own it, so it should not be handling it. Okay, uh, so the way we handle the routing is uh, we use another feature in the gig, which is called affinity, uh, where we can instruct the gig to say, hey, always route this interrupt to this core, right? So since we know that core two is executing sovereign domain, uh, and since we know that sovereign domain, uh, domain owns the display, we can already um, set the affinity uh, to say, always route uh, the display's interrupts to core two, and then that's what we do. Okay, uh, so hopefully that explains in these two execution modes, how do we handle interrupts for, for peripherals. Okay, uh, so now we, we looked at peripherals being owned by one domain at a time, and particularly we looked at display. Uh, as I said, there are several other sharing modes that we support. Uh, so there is exclusive, which we looked at. There is handover in the sense that at some point, uh, the chat app can say, I no longer want access to uh, the display. Uh, it can hand it over to someone else. Uh, there is multiplexing. So if, for example, if you have two buttons on the phone, uh, you can multiplex. One button can be assigned to um, each of these domains. right? So if you have multiple of resources, uh, then you can, uh, you can do this. Uh, there is read-only access. So typically, for example, GPS uh, can be safely shared because all the domains will simply try to read the data. Right? Um, and if it's read, then multiple domains can read safely. Uh, and then the last one is proxying, uh, where you software encryption um, for, let's say, network or um, uh, flash storage. Right? Um, in, in case of secure chat example, uh, we made the following choices. So for CPU and memory, uh, we use spatial isolation. So each of these cores uh, were, run, were running things in parallel uh, one domain at a time. Uh, for screen, we used handover in the sense when we started on the phone, uh, the legacy domain, meaning Android, uh, had access to the screen. And then when we launched the chat app, we, we said, hey, Android, now you should hand over the access of the screen uh, to our chat app. Right? Uh, and for network and storage, we use proxy to be software uh, encryption to do this. Um, so this is how uh, things look like in over time for, for, for the chat application. So there is a little encryption decryption for network and storage there's a proxy uh, for network and storage in the legacy domain uh, we've configured the the gic to do this uh, routing of isolation and in the memory uh, you see this different color coding uh, which says which memory uh, belongs to uh, which which domain right um yeah and over time we then change the ownership uh, 
uh, of this when the chat app is running uh, only the orange parts uh, are enabled and then in the end uh, when the chat app wants to kind of uh, um, uh, stop execution uh, it hands over the display uh, back to the legacy domain right uh, so now you might ask yourself hey this is a lot of interrupts and low level uh, design details which is all great but how does it impact the user right so uh, here's a little flow and i have a video i think we have time uh, for me to show you the video as well uh, so typically the way we expect people to use this is uh, you buy a phone, uh, you go to uh, whatever your favorite uh, shopping website, or you go to a physical store, you get a phone uh, which has sovereign uh, uh, T-time style security built in. Um, you can install sovereign apps. It right? doesn't really need much. Your phone says it's, in, it's installed. The firmware says, hey, I installed a sovereign app. Um, but how do you launch one of these apps? So the way we imagine this is that we have a, a, a switch, a physical uh, button, which says, switch me to the sovereign domain. So imagine like um, switching from, uh, I don't know, uh, your Windows machine to Linux on a, on a click, right? Uh, so it's like, yeah, switching, switching the execution. Uh, then uh, your legacy domain, your Android will help you do the switch, it will load and schedule the, the sovereign domain. Um, and during the switching, your uh, sovereign domain takes over resources uh, it wants to control. For example, maybe it wants to take over uh, the GUI, right? So the touch screen. Um, then the touch screen shows multiple apps that you have installed in the sovereign domain. For example, the chat app that we have been talking about so far. And then from the launcher, you can launch the chat app. It can do some checks, for example, to see whether this is indeed the chat app that you installed or has it been tampered with, so on and so forth. Um, you can text back and forth uh, uh, using encryption for storage and network. Uh, and once you're done, uh, you can exit the app on, and press the button again, and it will give back the touch screen and all the resources um, back to the legacy domain. Right. So sort of in the middle of using your phone, you press a button to boot a completely different operating system, use it, and press a button again to kind of shut it down and come back to Android. Just that it's not a whole booting, it's they're running simultaneously on your phone on different things. Right? Um, all right. Uh, so we have built this. Uh, we have built it on ARM platform. So there are some software emulators uh, that we can use that we have used to build all of this. Uh, and then now we are in the process of building this also on real phones, uh, some of the uh, open source phones that, that exist, which allows to prototype, prototype all of this. Uh, in terms of performance, I, I will not show you all the numbers. Uh, I will refer you to the paper where you can look at them. Uh, but two things uh, I wanted to highlight. One is uh, when the first time you launch uh, the sovereign domain, it takes a while. It's almost like you're booting a whole operating system. Uh, but from that time onwards, when you're switching back and forth uh, with, with this press of a button, it's, uh, the switching is fast. Right? Uh, OK, so let's see a demo. Let's see if that works. OK. Uh, Playback is not supported. Open fill in the browser. Um, so presenting. Okay. Do you see uh, the video? Yes. Great. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. Okay. So here is a, a little video. So right now, what is happening is this is on a on an ARM emulator, uh, we're running the normal world. So imagine this is your very ugly looking Android. Uh, and you're running a browser uh, on your Android phone. And now you want to switch to your chat app, right? Uh, so here there are two LEDs which show which world you're running in. So right now it's red, which means you, the display is attached to the, to the legacy world, right? Uh, then he, there is a new physical button that we have that the user can press uh, to take you to the, uh, to the sovereign world. Uh, as I said, it's almost like switching into a new operating system. Uh, the screen is auto-assigned to the sovereign world. So here you see the LEDs have changed now 
Um, it, it's now saying LED1 is active, uh, which is orange, which means the screen has been now uh, uh, physically detached, okay, physically meaning uh, in terms of memory and so on, has been detached from the legacy world. The legacy world doesn't know what's happening on the screen and has been securely uh, attached to your sovereign world, which is where it will you a bunch of apps. So for example, our favorite chat app has been pre-installed there. Um, you can launch it using the, using the launcher. Um, so far, the legacy app has no idea what you're doing, which is great. Uh, uh, here, our chat app loads uh, previous text messages from the Flash, uh, decrypts them securely, and then shows you on the screen. Again, uh, the legacy world cannot decrypt the, the messages on the disk. Uh, and then when, when it's being shown on the screen, also it doesn't know what's happening on the screen. So you, you get much better security than, let's say, Android. Uh, again, you can text and type and send your messages. Uh, here it uses the network. Again, it's uh, encrypted. So all of the packets are being sent by the, by the Android operating system. They're already encrypted, so it doesn't really know what's happening. Right. Um, it also fetches the messages, and then you can uh, essentially uh, continue doing this. Right. And once you're done, you can again press that button, which uh, will switch the access to uh, a different uh, back to your uh, browser. Right. OK. Uh, let's see if I have destroyed my um, screen sharing. All right. Ah, perfect. It remembers where we were. OK. All right. So, uh, so far, uh, we have looked at chat app as our primary example. We built a few other example apps, so uh, running a browser, running VPN, running secure storage. We just wanted to show different modes in which you can share the peripherals and so on. Uh, and then we built some apps, for example, the biometric authentication, which not just the users, but the operating system or the manufacturer can also find useful to run using this isolation. So that is all for my talk. Uh, if you're interested, we have an extensive uh, technical uh, paper on archive, including all the details that I was not able to cover and the evaluation and the performance and so on. Um, so uh, you can check that out. Uh, and then again, I'm here on behalf of uh, me and my collaborators and my students who have uh, done uh, all of this work at ETH. Uh, so thanks a lot uh, for your patience. Um, and then I'm happy to take any questions that you may have.